Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about biomolecules, which are also called macromolecules, which can also be called the molecules of life. So if you hear any of those words, they're all kind of interchangeable, like ninth grade and freshman are interchangeable, 12th grade and senior are interchangeable. So biomolecules, macromolecules, they are the molecules of life. Specifically, I will be talking about the TEKS, B9A and B9C, a readiness and a supporting teak. So biomolecules, I love this little pictogram going on here from the amoeba sisters. We all know and love the amoeba sisters. This is showing you the four biomolecules that we'll be talking about. They are the building blocks of life. We have nucleic acids, we have carbohydrates, we have lipids, and lastly, proteins. And this is showing you how these structures are put together. I love this little moving diagram. We will be re referring back to this so you guys can get a really good picture of what is happening as these molecules are being built. So let's go over some basic vocabulary before we get started. So we are in biology and we know that bio means life and biology is the study of life. Macro means large. So we've talked about biomolecules, our living molecules, or molecules for life, right? And macromolecules just mean that they are quite large. So these are quite large molecules that help to build up things that are alive. We also have some other prefixes here, mono. Mono means one. And poly. Poly means many, typically referring to four or more, but it means many. We also have a suffix here that's really important. It's mer. So there's the beginning part of the word and then mer. A suffix, a suffix is at the end of the word. So mer means subunits or pieces. So let's put these together. A monomer means one piece. It's a subunit. So what's a polymer? Poly means many. Mer means piece, many pieces. So you can see in this image here that we have monomers, which are one little tiny individual block, right? Each one of these is a monomer. And when you polymerize them or you put them together, you form a polymer, which means many pieces. So this is a large unit that has lots of monomers in it. So that's how you would use these words. And this is, remember, we're talking about building blocks. So we're definitely going to be talking about building things, which is going to be creating polymers, right? Polymers, many pieces, many of our subunits put together. Okay, so how are monomers turned into polymers? Let's break down the question. Monomer is one piece. How are a bunch of one little subunit pieces turned into one very large thing called a polymer. How do we take little pieces and turn them into one large thing? Okay, the reaction is called dehydration synthesis. Now everyone knows what dehydration is. We've all felt it, especially those of us that are living here in Texas. Over the summer, it's hot, you're sweating. If you're not replenishing the fluids in your body, you become dehydrated. And how do you know this? Because your urine turns very bright yellow which means you need to add some water to your body. Okay, but dehydration synthesis means that you're removing water and building something. Okay, so synthesis is a building reaction. It literally means to make or to build. So dehydration is by removing water and synthesis is to make. So how are we turning monomers into polymers? We're taking away water in order to combine things together. Okay, so here's how you do that. You can see that we have one subunit here called a monomer plus another monomer. This little arrow means like turns into or equals or it reacts to become. Now we have one molecule. It kind of looks like they're holding hands right here over this oxygen bridge, okay? But we also have a plus sign plus this thing right here called H2O. What's H2O? It's water. So we are dehydrating these molecules right here. We're taking away H2O in order to make them hold hands and come together. So we have a monomer plus a monomer. We're taking out the water to join them together. So we have a polymer and a 
hydro or H2O, which is a water molecule left over here. Okay. So this is an example of a building reaction. We are taking small things and building a larger molecule. More than one subunit are joined together to make a larger subunit. This is called an anabolic reaction. Okay. You can remember this if you think about anabolic steroids people who are doing steroids to make their muscles grow really big. They're in the gym. I like to pick things up and put things down, right? They are getting larger muscles because they are building. Okay. Anabolic is a building reaction. So you're taking little pieces and you're making something larger. Again, dehydration synthesis is to build things by taking away water. That's how you're joining them together. So can we go the other way? Can we take polymers and break them down into monomers? Can we take those large pieces and turn them into small little subunits? Yes, absolutely. It's a reverse reaction. You'll see this is exactly the opposite picture that we just looked at. This reaction is called hydrolysis. Now, what does hydro mean? Hydro is referring to water and lysis means to break. So this means to break with the addition of water. So when you add water, it's gonna break things apart. Okay, so we see exactly the reverse reaction. Here we have a polymer. This is really like a dye. It's got two pieces here, but we're gonna call this a polymer, okay? We have a large molecule that we are adding water, hydro, we're adding water to it, and we're gonna lyse it, lysis. We're breaking it apart. Here's that water molecule, okay? So we have one molecule plus water, gives us two molecules, hydrolysis, hydrolysis. We're breaking this apart with the addition of water, okay? So this is a breaking reaction. It is the opposite of dehydration synthesis. It's the opposite of that, okay? Um, we have a large subunit being broken down into small units. Okay, and this is called a catabolic reaction. It's the opposite of an anabolic reaction. I like to think about this like cats have claws. Claws tear things apart, they're breaking it down. So I like to think catabolic, cats have claws, must be breaking it down. And then all you have to remember is that anabolic is exactly the opposite. So hydrolysis is catabolic, which means to break down and Dehydration synthesis is anabolic, which means to build. Those are the two types of reactions that we're gonna have in order to create larger molecules or smaller molecules, depending on what we're trying to do. So we're gonna talk about the four main biomolecules here. Again, biomolecules can also be called macromolecules. They mean the same thing, okay? They are molecules that help us build our living things and they are typically large molecules. We have carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now, I like to go through them in this specific order because of the elements that make up each one of these biomolecules, and we'll talk about those in just a second. But I go carbs, lipids, protein, nucleic acids. That's always the way that I like to remember them. So first, let's start out with carbs. Everyone has heard of carbs. You've probably at least heard of some low-carb diet or being carb conscious. Carbs are sugars. That's what they are. So what is a carb? A carb is a sugar. They often end in the suffix os, O-S-E, like glucose, fructose, sucrose. You've heard of some of these before, right? Everyone's heard of glucose. We know the plants make it. Okay, sucrose is like the white sugar that you would add to like cake in order to make it very sweet, okay? So what's the purpose of a carb? Carbs are energy and they are sugars, and sugars give you short-term energy. I like to think about the S's there, sugar, short-term. They both start with an S. So they provide very quick energy. They're really simple structures, and they can be kind of broken down readily, okay? The elements that make up a carbohydrate are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We call that CHO. We call that CHO, C-H-O, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. However, this molecule is special because it has to follow a one to two to one ratio. Now, what the heck does that mean? It means if you're C-H-O, we have C-H-O, one to two to one. That means that there has to be twice as many hydrogens 
as carbons and oxygens. Now I know that that's hard for you to imagine. So let's look at this right here. C6H12O6. This is the molecular formula for glucose, which is a sugar. Sugar, short-term energy, it's a carb, okay? So if you look at the 12 and the 6, you know that this 6, this 12, and this 6, if you divide all of them by 6, 6 divided by 6 is 1, 12 divided by 6 is 2, 6 divided by 6 is 1. That gives you a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So all it means is that there's twice as much hydrogen as there are carbon and oxygen. So carbon and oxygen always equal and then twice as much hydrogen. That is a one to two to one ratio, okay? So if you just look at the little numbers here, there's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. If you can divide all of those and end up with a one to two to one ratio, then that means it is a carbohydrate, okay? Next, we're gonna talk about the monomer. A monomer means one piece. One piece is called a monosaccharide, means one sugar. Mono is one, saccharide means sugar, means one sugar. This is a picture of a monosaccharide. It kind of looks like a stop sign, okay? I like to think it looks like a stop sign because it starts with the letter S, and so does sugar, and so does short term. Stop sign, sugar, short term. So it tells you what it is. It's a sugar, short term energy, and it looks like a stop sign, okay? We also have polymers, poly, many, mer, piece, many pieces put together, a large unit. These can be called a disaccharide, which means two sugars, trisaccharide, which means three sugars, or a polysaccharide, which is many sugars. Okay, when we have these really big subunits or these really large polymers made of lots and lots and lots of subunits, they're polysaccharides and they're used to store energy, right? Um, plants store their energy as starch. You might have heard of cornstarch. That's how they store their energy. So plants, polysaccharides, they're very huge carbohydrates. Starch, that's stored energy in a plant. Stored energy in people or other animals is called glycogen. So our polysaccharides as animals is called glycogen. It's a very large polymer of carbohydrates and it is called glycogen. So in plants, it's called starch, and in animals, it's called glycogen. Here's some more pictures for you, just to kind of give you a little bit more practice identifying these. So carbohydrates, sugar, short-term energy, looks like a stop sign. Okay, these look like stop signs. We have glucose, O-S-E, fructose, O-S-E, O-S, O-S, and this together makes up sucrose, O-S-E. It's a disaccharide, okay? So carbohydrates have these ring structures in them, but you might also see them like this. These are also carbs, okay? So as you can see here, it's counting all these little carb uh, carbons. There are six of them. There are six oxygens, and there are 12 hydrogens which means C6H12O6, it's glucose, okay? And that is still glucose because it's a one to two to one ratio of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It's exactly the same thing. It's just not in this pretty little ring form, okay? It's exactly the same molecule. So if it looks like this, you can always just count and see, is it a one to two to one ratio? Do I have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nothing else? Then it better be a carbohydrate. Okay, and always look out for the suffix of O-S-E. O -S -E. Oftentimes, carbohydrates end in O-S. That means it's a sugar. Okay, polysaccharides, many sugars, poly, many, saccharide, sugar, many sugars are also structural molecules. Okay, we have cellulose, O-S-E. Cellulose means it's a sugar. And you know that this is the main component that's in a plant cell wall. So plant cell walls are made of this polysaccharide called cellulose. It's very strong and that's what gives the plant its support, right? And then we have this other word over here. It's spelled like chitin. It's pronounced chitin, okay? And that's what's in exoskeletons. And it is the same thing. It is a polysaccharide. It's a whole bunch of little sugars all put together to make a very, very, very large molecule, okay? So it is a hard, tough, outer covering exoskeleton on certain animals, okay? And we have, like I said, cellulose is a whole bunch of small sugar molecules all put together in order to make plant cell walls.
Next, we have lipids. So we went through carbs. Now we're doing lipids. We had CHO, C-H-O, with a one to two to one ratio for carbohydrates. For lipids, we have CHO again. But this time, there's no special ratio, okay? Lipids are fats. If you think about liposuction, lip, lipid, L-I-P, fat. Think that, right? Liposuction is when they suction fat out of people. Lipids are fats, and LIP means fat, okay? So what's the purpose here? Again, energy. We had short-term energy with carbohydrates, and here, lipid L are long-term energy. Lipid L long L. You like the alliteration, okay? Lipid L long L, long-term energy. And insulation. You know that animals that live in really, really cold environments have a whole lot of blubber, that it's made of fat, and fats are lipids and it's to help insulate them to keep them warm in their environments. Like I said, the elements that we have here are CHO. We had CHO for carbs, we have CHO again for lipids, but the big difference is that lipids don't have a special ratio. That's just carbohydrates. Carbohydrates have a one to two to one ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Here, we just have CHO, C-H-O. There's no special ratio, but you will find that there's a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen, and only a little bit of ox oxygen. So if you look at this picture here, you see that you have a couple oxygens here, but everything else is a C or an H, everything else, there's so many of them, okay? There's no special ratio here. Lipids have CHO, nothing else, and there's no special ratio, okay? The monomer, one piece, one piece, is called a triglyceride, okay? It's a glycerol backbone, with three fatty acid tails. What does tri mean? Tri means three. So the glyceride is referring to the glycerol backbone, which is this part over here. Okay, and then the three fatty acid tails are the fatty acid tails coming off. They look like these little zigzaggy guys, or they look like these C's to all these H's. This is actually showing you like the same thing here, but it just is a different representation. You'll learn about that in chemistry, okay? Important things about lipids, they are hydrophobic. Hydro, again, like hydrolysis, it means water. Hydro, water, phobic. Phobic, if you have a phobia, you're afraid of something. So this literally means fats are uh, water fearing. They're afraid of water, okay? So they don't like to mix with water. If you were ever a little kid and you put food coloring in like oil or water and you try to shake oil mixed with water, it shakes for a little bit, but then eventually it settles back out. Or like your salad dressing in your refrigerator, you'll notice that it starts to separate and there's like a like oily layer and then the rest of it, and you gotta shake it up really well before you put it on your salad, right? That's because lipids are hydrophobic and they don't like to mix with water, okay? And lipids make up fats, oils, and waxes. You'll see that plants have like waxy coatings on their leaves, things like cacti and succulents. Okay, and that's for protection. It's a, it's a lipid coating to help protect them against water loss. So phospholipids are a type of fat. It's a lipid, a phospholipid. They're, they're extremely important when we talk about the cell membrane, which is gonna be our next unit. Okay, but they are lipids. So it has a phosphate attached to glycerol and our hydrophobic tails here are fatty acids. So it's a phosphate on top of a lipid. Okay, it's called a phospholipid because it has a phosphate on top of a lipid. And they form a bilayer or two layers like this, where you have the hydrophilic water loving, hydrophilic water loving heads, right? Which are the phosphates and the hydro water phobic, hydrophobic fearing, water fearing tails are all in the middle. They form these bilayers. And that's gonna be very important coming up. So lipids are largely found in all cell membranes, okay? Cell membranes are phospholipid bilayers, two layers of phosphates stuck onto lipids, okay? So this is a picture of a lipid. Each one of these is a lipid. This is a lipid. Oops, these pictures here are lipids. They kind of have like a base and then all these tails, the fatty acid tails, okay? They all kind of look like that. 
So the next thing you need to know about lipids is whether they are saturated or they are unsaturated. And this is really easy to determine because it all has to do with the shape. So if you're looking at a saturated lipid, it's a straight line, okay, straight line. Or if it's an unsaturated lipid, it has a bend in it right here. This is a carbon to carbon double bond. There are two bonds, carbon to carbon double bond. And it causes a bend to occur. But you'll also notice that because we have this new bond, we're kind of missing out on two extra hydrogens that could be here, right? So it's saturated if it has as many hydrogens as it could possibly fit on the molecule. It is unsaturated if it has a carbon to carbon double bond because this means you're really missing out on hydrogens and it changes the shape. So saturated lipids are saturated, have as many as possible. We're talking about hydrogens. They are saturated in hydrogens and they're solid at room temperature. If you look at this and you imagine stacking a whole bunch of these on top of each other, they kind of are like little bricks. Okay, they are solid at room temperature. So these are fats that are solid at room temperature if you think about like butter, right? When you put it out on your counter, it's not like liquid. It might get soft so you can spread it on your toast, right? But it's not like liquid and runny. It's just a solid that is more flexible than it used to be when it was in your refrigerator, right? But it is a solid brick, think butter, okay? Unsaturated lipids, that contain a carbon to carbon double bond, they have less hydrogen than they really could have, right? Because saturated have as many hydrogens as possible. But when you have a carbon to carbon double bond, you're taking away two hydrogens, okay? These are liquid at room temperature. Think about your olive oil, avocado oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, okay? These things are liquid at room temperature. So if you just have it out on your counter, butter is solid. That's saturated, solid, saturated. You see this alliteration theme that we have going on here, okay? And at room temperature, unsaturated lipids are liquid, okay? Trans fats are another type of fat that you might see on like a food label, okay? They're a type of unsaturated fat. They're a whole nother thing, but they are a type of unsaturated fat. Lipids, fats, are also steroids and waxes. And we briefly touched on the wax part earlier, okay? So steroids are four ring structures and you're like, but this looks like a carbohydrate. Okay, steroids are just a little bit different. They typically have four rings put together. And the most important one we're gonna talk about is cholesterol. You've heard of this, you know Honey Nut Cheerios is supposed to lower your cholesterol. Okay, we're talking about cholesterol that is inside of the cell membrane, which we're gonna get to in the next unit, but it's really, really important because it helps to maintain the membrane fluidity. And steroids can also act as hormones in your body to help regulate things in your body that, you know, need a little bit of help regulating. Waxes, you know what a wax is, okay? Like I said, with with plants, they often have waxy leaves and that's in order to protect them from being dehydrated, okay? So waxes, you don't need to know this here that they're esters made of alcohol chains and fatty acid chain. You just need to know that they are a type of lipid. So they're a type of fat. Steroids are a type of fat. Waxes are a type of fat, okay? And if you think about it, wax is very hydrophobic. So that can help you remember that. So we went carbs, lipids, now we're on to proteins. So we went cho, cho, now we're gonna add chon, sometimes S. So C-H-O-N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and occasionally sulfur, chon, right? Okay, so proteins are our third major class of biomolecule and they are really cool because they do a lot of things. So what is a protein? Proteins are enzymes and they are also structural components. They build things. So they are either enzymes, which we're gonna learn about in a second, or they build things in your body or in a plant or other organism. So the purpose here is that enzymes speed up chemical reactions. They make them happen faster by lowering the activation energy, okay? So enzymes, 
help to speed up reactions by making it less hard to get started, essentially. So there's energy that needs to build up before chemical reactions can take place, but enzymes make that a lot easier. So they happen a lot faster. And like I said, proteins are also structural proteins. They help to build things, okay? They help to create structure. Now, like I said, the elements that we're talking about here are chons. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, occasionally sulfur. So we went cho-cho, now we're on chon. I like to think chon ends with an N, protein ends with an N. If you can't remember, chon, protein, they both end with an N, okay? The monomer here is an amino acid, okay? And here's how I remember the monomer. And if you think this is dumb, that's totally fine. Proteins, think about teen, like you are a teen. Proteins, like A's, the letter. You like to make A's in grade books as in a 90 or higher, okay? Proteins like to make A's, amino acid, okay? Teens like A's, remember that. That's the monomer, amino acid. This is what an amino acid looks like. And if you look through carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Okay, but well, what is this? This is an R and R is not in Chon. So what the heck is going on here? R is a placeholder. And you're gonna see that when we're looking at amino acids because there are really 20 amino acids and each one of these sections right here attached to this middle carbon, they're all different. So instead of having 20 different pictures, they're just like, mm, it's gonna have something here and R is just like a placeholder. All of this stuff up top is identical in all of them, but this part is different, 20 different times different, right? So this is just a, a little diagram to show you, this is the overall structure. Now R is not an element, it's just a placeholder. So you can kind of just ignore it like it's not even there. But you can see that we have carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogens, C-H-O-N, chon, means protein, okay? We do have polymers of proteins, they're called proteins. We're really creative here. But they're also called poly, many, peptides, poly, peptides, many peptides. So what the heck is a peptide? Okay, amino acids are stuck together like this, like beads on a string. They're stuck together by these little bonds in between them. Those little bonds that bring them together are called peptide bonds. And a protein is also called a polypeptide because it has many peptide bonds holding all those little amino acids together. So when many amino acids are joined together, there's a lot of peptide bonds. That's where polypeptide comes from. So protein, polypeptide mean exactly the same thing. So here's some images for you to get a feel for what proteins look like. You can see the different amino acids here. And do you need to look at this and say, oh, that's an amino acid? I mean, not necessarily, but you should be able to look at it and tell me it's a protein because you see C-H-O-N. I don't see any other letters. I see C-H-O-N protein, C-H-O-N, called chon, okay? So like I said, amino acids are kind of like beads on a string. So this is an example of what an amino acid chain looks like. And all those letters that you see in there, those are like abbreviations for what the amino acids are called. You don't need to know what they're called, but that's what the letters stand for. They're the same things that you'd find on this. This is a codon chart that has 20 different amino acids. We'll learn how to use that later. It looks a lot scarier than it is, I promise. And lastly, it's important that you know that proteins, they have these special shapes, right? They all, like if you look at this, you can kind of see that they're very different shapes than our other biomolecules. Their shapes are very sensitive. There's a small range where their shapes are what they're supposed to be. And if they're outside of that range, too hot, too cold, too acidic, too basic, then they become denatured, which means that the shape is changing and they're no longer gonna do what they're supposed to do. They're no longer gonna build the thing they're supposed to build if they're for structure. And they're no longer going to speed up the reaction of that specific reaction if the shape changes. So that's called being denatured, okay? And that happens when the temperature and the pH 
is too far out of the optimal range, which is the range where the protein likes to live. So proteins are a little finicky. They're a little picky about their environment. They really like certain temperatures. They really like certain pHs. And if they're outside of that, they don't really like to do their jobs very well. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Okay, so let's talk about how proteins act as enzymes. Okay, enzymes speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. So what does that even look like? Okay, if we start out here with a reactant and we end up down here with a product, we're going through a reaction. Reactants become products. If you don't use an enzyme, this red line shows you how much energy has to build all the way up, 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 up until we can reach the apex and then come back down to create our products. That's without the enzyme. If we add an enzyme with the enzyme, we're looking at the blue line. We start at the same reactant, and now we just need to build up a little bit of energy to then go on with the reaction. The bottom one is going to happen a lot faster, and that's because the enzyme is there to help lower the activation energy. So you can see this is the original activation energy, and this is the new one when we have the enzyme. So this is the difference in the activation energy. It's much, 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 much lower. So this reaction will happen much faster because we have an enzyme, okay? Um, you know that we have special endings for words here like glucose, sucrose, O-S-E means sugar. There's a new one that we're gonna add. It's A-S-E, ACE, okay? So I like to think enzymes speed things up right? They're like, they are very organized. They get things done. They kick some ace. Think about it. All right. So they're going in there, they're doing their jobs. They're speeding everything up. They're kicking some ace. Okay. So if you think about enzymes ending in ace, we're talking about like catalase, amylase. Okay. They end in A-S-E. And enzymes are very specific they work just like a lock and a key, which again, we're gonna talk about more in just a second. They're only good for that one job. You only have one job, right? That's what enzymes are. And each job is a different chemical reaction that they are supposed to catalyze, okay? So I'm gonna talk about this picture right here. This blue part is the enzyme. The enzyme is the protein. Proteins are enzymes. This is the protein and they speed up chemical reactions. So we're gonna take a substrate, just a reactant, the starting molecule, and it's gonna join into this active site of our enzyme. It's gonna join the substrate or the reactant, the starting molecule is gonna join our enzyme right here in the active site. Then we have them bound together and this reaction is taking place. And lastly, we're releasing a product from the enzyme. So if you look at this, we can see our starting molecule is large. It goes in, it gets broken down, and we have two smaller products that are released. A larger molecule goes in and small molecules come out. Is this a building reaction or is this a breaking reaction? Are we building something up or are we breaking something down? To me, I see a large molecule being broken. Cats have claws, they tear things apart. This is a catabolic reaction that this enzyme is helping us to complete. We're breaking down this substrate into these two products. Cats have claws, they break things down, catabolic. And again, that's called hydrolysis, to break with water. So somewhere, Water is most likely involved here, okay? But we have the enzyme that binds to the substrate and it catalyzes the reaction and we release our products. So I said that enzymes are like locks and keys, okay? So it only does one job, that's it. It only has one job and that's all it does forever. So just like your key that you have goes to your house and it unlocks your door if you try to bring that to school and unlock the school with it, that key is not gonna do anything. It's not going to do that reaction. It's not going to open that door. So enzymes are exactly the same way. That one enzyme has a special name and it's made for a special purpose and it does absolutely nothing else, okay? 
And the same way that every day you go home from school, you can unlock your door using the same old key. You don't have to get a new one every single time you come home. You use the exact same key. I mean, unless something happens to it, but you use the exact same key. So enzymes are the same way. So it's a protein and you're constantly just using that same one. You don't need to get a new one every single time you want to do a reaction. You don't get a new key every single time you want to open your door, right? So enzymes are reusable and you can use them over and over and over again until they quote break or become denatured like we were talking about. So when an enzyme becomes denatured, the shape of it changes. If you change the shape of your house key, it's not going to open your door anymore. So it's kind of useless, okay? That's what happens to enzymes when they are outside of their natural range, their optimal range. And this is talking about temperature and pH, like I mentioned briefly earlier. If it is too hot or too cold for that enzyme and it's not right where it wants to be, like Goldilocks in the middle, then it's not really going to do its job very well. And if it's outside of its pH, if it's too acidic or too basic, that enzyme isn't going to function very well. It might do a little bit of a reaction, but it's not going to be as good as it is as if it's in its happy place, its happy environment. And every enzyme's happy place is different. Some of them like to function in hot temperatures. Some of them like to function in cold temperatures. Some of them function the best in basic environments. Some of them function the best in acidic environments. It depends on every single enzyme. They're all very different, right? So if you apply too much heat, too much of a pH, you change the surroundings so much, the enzyme changes shape. Well, now it's no longer going to work at all. Its shape is completely changed. That key is not going to open your door, and this enzyme is not going to do the reaction it's supposed to do. Okay, last one. So we went carbs, lipids, proteins. Now we're on to nucleic acids. So we went cho, cho, chon. Now we're adding chon p or chon p. Okay, this is our elements going down. So nucleic acids, what are they? They're genetic information. You've heard of this stuff called DNA, D-N-A, N-A, nucleic acid. You might have heard of RNA, R-N-A, nucleic acid. So we have deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid, okay? So they are genetic information. And what's its job? It is the blueprint for, for you. If it's your DNA, it's the blueprint for some trees. If it's tree DNA, Everything that's alive has to have DNA. So this is the blueprint for how to make that. All the instructions and everything needed in order to carry out the, the functions to make that thing. Okay? So like I said, the elements that we're talking about here are C-H-O-N-P. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus. I said I like to teach them in this order because that's the easiest way for my mind. You go carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. CHO, CHO, CHON, then CHONP, Cho Cho Chon, Chonp, Chon P. Okay, so now we are adding phosphorus. So anytime you see a P, you know it has to be a nucleic acid. Oops, I'm so sorry. Okay, so here is the basic structure here of a nucleotide. The monomer, one piece of a nucleic acid, is a nucleotide. It's made of a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar. And a nitrogenous base. Now, nitrogenous sounds like an exotic, fancy word. It means it has nitrogen. You see this little N? Boom. Nitrogenous base. Okay? Phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base. This whole thing is called a nucleotide. Lots and lots of nucleotides together can make up DNA and RNA. Okay? So that's the polymer is DNA and RNA. Again, we have a phosphate group, a sugar and a nitrogenous base, a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So there are four different DNA nucleotides, so four building blocks to make up anything that has DNA. Okay, we have guanine, thymine, adenine, and cytosine. And we'll talk about all of those in greater detail later. But notice they all have phosphate groups, sugar, nitrogenous base phosphate group, sugar, nitrogenous base, phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base, phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base. These are all nucleic 
uh, sorry, these are all subunits of nucleic acids that are called nucleotides. Lots of nucleotides together make up a nucleic acid like DNA or RNA. And here are two pictures of DNA versus RNA. You notice right away that there's a pretty big difference. DNA is double-stranded. RNA has one strand. And one of the bases, one of the nitrogenous bases is different, but the three in the middle are all the same. And like I said, we will learn about this a little bit later. But you've probably heard of this in middle school at least. So thymine goes with DNA and uracil goes with RNA. But this is the structural difference between them. We have a double-stranded molecule versus a single-stranded molecule. And again, NA stands for nucleic acid, nucleic acid, nucleic acid. Okay, and all of the little subunits that build this are nucleotides. They are nucleotides. Okay, this is a section that is like question and answer. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to answer some questions and tell you how I would remember this. If you want to stop there, your notes end right here. So you learned about the four biomolecules today. You have carbs, sugar, short-term energy, shaped like a stop sign. You have lipids, long-term energy, insulation. They are shaped like you've got a backbone and then like little squiggly tails. There's usually three of them. In phospholipids, there are two of them, however. Then you have your proteins, which are enzymes. Enzymes work like a lock and key. They speed up chemical reactions. Okay, and we have our nucleic acids, which are our genetic information. We have DNA and we have RNA, double-stranded molecules versus single-stranded molecules. Okay, so now I'm going to go through these and practice answering a few questions. So what is the monomer of a protein? One piece of a protein. Remember, protein, teens like to make A's in school. Teens like A's, amino acid. It's amino acid. How do enzymes speed up chemical reactions? If you remember that graph, there's a red line and a blue line. The blue line was a lot lower because it lowers the activation energy. So enzymes speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy for that chemical reaction. Which biomolecule contains CHO in a one to two to one ratio? It's carbs. Carbs, sugars have to have a one to two to one ratio of carbs, hydrogen, and oxygen, like C6, H12, O6, which is glucose. What is another word for polymer of a protein? So polymer is many pieces, and a protein is made up of amino acids. Amino acids are held together by peptide bonds. So if I have a lot of amino acids, I also have a lot of peptide bonds. So another name for a protein is a polypeptide. Which elements are in lipids? Cho, cho, chon, chon, p. It's the second cho, C-H-O, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. No special ratio. What is the purpose of carbohydrates? Well, carbohydrates are sugar. Think about S's, sugar, short-term energy, and they are also shaped like stop signs. Steroids fall under which biomolecule category? Okay, we have carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Steroids are lipids. They're fats. They don't like to mix with water. The most important steroid we're going to talk about is cholesterol, and that is very important to maintain the cell membrane fluidity. A phosphate group, sugar, and a nitrogenous base make up a nucleotide, and lots of nucleotides put together make up DNA or RNA, depending on which nucleotides. What binds to an enzyme? So an enzyme speeds up chemical reactions by lowering activation energy. So you have the reactants and the products are still the same, but the reaction is going to take place faster. So a substrate binds to an enzyme. It can also be called a reactant, a starting molecule. So substrate, reactant, starting molecule binds to an enzyme. And then, of course, the enzyme releases the product. What's the difference between saturated and unsaturated lipids? Okay, so lipids are CH and O, and they have a lot of Cs and a lot of Hs. 
So remember that saturated means that it has all the hydrogens that it can possibly fit. It's like a little brick, like butter, okay? Unsaturated lipids have a carbon to carbon double bond, which means that they're missing some potential hydrogens. So that's the difference between them. Saturated are solid at room temperature, saturated solid, solid saturated. And if it is liquid at room temperature, the fat is an unsaturated fat because it has a carbon to carbon double bond. They can't pack as tightly together. What reaction takes monomers and makes polymers? Monomers are one piece, little tiny, tiny subunits. And a polymer is a big thing, okay? So little things to a big thing. That's a building reaction. That's an anabolic reaction. And we talked about dehydration synthesis. We're building things by taking away water. What is cholesterol? Well, we just talked about that. So cholesterol is a special lipid called a steroid. It's called a steroid and it is inside of the membrane of all cells, the cellular membrane, and it maintains the membrane fluidity. What reaction is considered a breaking reaction? Breaking, so we got anabolic and we got catabolic. Cats have claws, they break things apart, they tear them down. So catabolic reactions are breaking and the one we talked about today is called hydrolysis, to break by adding water. What is the product of an anabolic reaction? If you are having an anabolic reaction take place, you are building something. So you're taking small pieces called monomers and you're putting them together to make a large thing called a polymer. So what's the product of an anabolic reaction? It's a polymer. The polymer is what's built in an anabolic reaction. What is this? Okay, so when I look like when I look at this, I see sucrose O S E. I see glucose O S E. I see fructose O S E. I also see the word di meaning to saccharide meaning sugar. And they look like stop signs to me. This is a carbohydrate. What is this? When I look at this, I'm going to look at the elements. I see C H O N. And then I see this thing called R, and I know that that's special and that I should ignore it. C-H-O-N, chon, means protein. They both end with an N. So this is a subunit of a protein. This is an amino acid. Amino acids make up proteins. What is this? I see a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So... I have three parts that make up this thing called a nucleotide, and a nucleotide is a subunit of a nucleic acid. What is this? Okay, it's a little bit blurry, but we can still see what's going on here. I have a substrate that is attaching to an enzyme in the active site of the enzyme where the activity happens. They're bound together, we add water, and then we have two separate products. One large thing goes in, two smaller thing goes out. We're adding water to break apart this product or these, um, to make these products. We are breaking down the sucrose into fructose and glucose. It's a breaking reaction called a catabolic reaction. And this one specifically is hydrolysis because we're breaking by adding water. What is this? I see two strands. I see a sugar phosphate backbone. I see adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine. This is a nucleic acid. This nucleic acid is called DNA. What is this? I see stop sign shapes. I see C, H, O, and I see nothing else. This N just means repeating. Okay, ignore that. Um, but it looks like little stop signs. It looks like they're all holding hands. This to me looks like a polysaccharide, specifically a trisaccharide in this picture. This is a carbohydrate. What is this? I see one strand. I see 
cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. This is nucleobases or nucleotides of RNA. I know that RNA stands for nucleic acid. This is a nucleic acid. What is this? Waxes, steroids, and used for insulation. I know this is a lipid. Lipids are water fearing. Lipids are fat. Lipids are used for insulation and also compose waxes and steroids. What is this? Short term energy. S, short term, is sugar. And sugars are carbohydrates. This is a carbohydrate. What is this? Okay, we looked at this graph earlier. We have reactants up here, products down here, and this lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of energy is needed if we're gonna do it this way, but if we are looking at the red line, we're adding in an enzyme, and it is not as much energy that needs to be built up. So this is showing you the difference in the activation energy when you use an enzyme like in the red graph here. What is this? Chitin. It's not pronounced chitin. It's chitin. Chitin is a special polysaccharide, many sugars, so it's a carb, that makes up the exoskeleton in certain animals. What is this? Cellulose, O-S-E, means sugar, which is a carbohydrate. This cellulose is the polysaccharide that makes up plant cell walls. What is this? Well, what is this specifically? We have a substrate binding to an enzyme and we have two products that come out. So this is a breaking reaction, which means it's catabolic, which means it's hydrolysis. A is a substrate. B is the active site. C is the enzyme. D is this intermediate step that we call the enzyme substrate complex. They're just bound together. E is the released enzyme, same thing as C. And F is our products. That's what was created because we broke down substrate A into products F with the help of this enzyme. What is this? Here I see an enzyme. <clears throat> I see substrates and I see a product. I see two substrates going in and one product coming out. We are taking small things and making a larger thing, monomers to a polymer. This is a building reaction that's called dehydration synthesis or an anabolic reaction. Yay, we have reached the end. This chart right here is really a great way to help you remember some of this information. If you are a visual learner, um, take a screenshot of this, write this into your notes. This is gonna help you make some of these connections. So biochemistry is kind of what this unit falls under. So this is talking about the chemicals of life. That's essentially what biochemistry is. So we're talking biomolecules or the molecules of life. Well, molecules are made of chemicals and elements. Okay, so this is a really great little review for you to go through. And it kind of nicely packages and summarizes the ideas that we've been talking about today. Okay, I am gonna like go all the way back up for a second. Like, I'm sorry. Just watch your eyes. I could have just exited out of this and come back. But you know what, we are where we are. Um, I wanted to go back to this page here to show you that we have talked about nucleic acids. You can see it's being built of nucleotides. Carbohydrates are made of monosaccharides put together. Lipids are glycerol with three fatty acid tails called the triglyceride. And amino acids being stuck together by peptide bonds makes proteins also called the polypeptides. And again, I went through the different types of reactions, but I taught them in this order, carbohydrates, lipids, Proteins, nucleic acids, cho, cho, chon, chon p. Always check your elements if you're trying to identify what biomolecule you're looking at. Start with the elements, start with the overall shapes. Thanks, you guys. I'll see you in the next one.